So in three, two, I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for October 23rd, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the Chair of a Committee at their discretion and after consultation with the Staff Liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Dolosky? Present. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Dr. Wistad? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Lanza? Present. Thank you. Please call the roll of staff members participating. Oh, we did that one. Please yes. call the names of all other staff members participating in the meeting. We have no one else. OK, thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair and saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name in a second. Committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call, please. Um, assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is our October and a half meeting, I think. So we've added half meetings and Dr. DiDonato and I talked because this is our second one. We'll see if we go, if the same thing happens in November where we feel we need another one, then we'll, as a committee, take a look at the calendar and decide um, how to proceed for the rest you know, rest of the calendar year or school year. So, but today we have um, three items and we had decided on these last time. And the first one is elementary literacy. Okay, I see Ms. Pumphrey, your message. Um, wait a second, I'm sorry, I got distracted because Mr. Corns talked me through how to fix the volume. I was going to tell her how to do it, but I'm sure Mr. Corns is helping her now. But we will discuss and answer any questions on the elementary literacy interventions and the HMH updates. So Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Kraft, I think, are here to respond to any questions and give us a, a brief summary of the PowerPoint. OK, so we will get just because I know it's a little bit of a full agenda in our, our hour. I am going to turn it right over to Dr. Kraft and let her um, provide some updates about HMH into reading, um, which we're doing at the elementary level, as well as um, elementary reading interventions. Great, thank you, Dr. DiDonato. Um, I know because of the limited time, I, I'm not gonna go slide by slide because I know that uh, we did um, prepare it ahead of time um, so that you all could, could listen to it. Um, but I thought that maybe we could um, fast forward to um, the fidelity of implementation because I do wanna talk about that. Well, let's actually go to slide 10. Um, I'll go back one more for me, sorry. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, our, um, the way that we support. And so, um, as you know, we have uh, now been implementing for a couple months HMH into reading. I'm actually getting some really good feedback. Um, I, we're still in a learning curve. Um, it's not perfect yet, um, but um, for the most part, the feedback I'm getting is that it's going really well and, and that staff are really happy with the selection that we made and how it's supporting students. Um, and so that really is our core. And with that core, we also talk about the professional development we provide for it. And so one of the exciting updates I can provide is that this week will be our first week of coaching. So every 
um, elementary school will receive uh, coaching in the fall and the spring. It will be the same coach. That coach will also provide contact information so that um, staff can reach directly out to the coach in between visits um, and get support as they need it as they're navigating the new program. After every after every school has had a coaching visit, we will do some leadership walkthroughs, which will be a way for us to start looking at instruction and calibrating our conversations and what are we looking for and how do we support it? It will also be informative around what additional professional development is needed uh, in the schools. Um, we continue to offer support around open court, both for teachers and administrators. Uh, we have developed some additional look for tools for open court that are more student centered so that we're actually looking at what the students are doing. Um, we continue to offer uh, additional sections of letters, professional development, the third edition and our um, BCPS created Science of Reading Schoology course um, has been very, very popular and we've had a lot of teachers register for that. And so we kind of have multi-pronged, provided lots of different opportunities to really support our core instruction. And then as you see, and I know I talked about it, so I won't go through every single program. The main thing I wanted to talk about is, um, I'm gonna use the example of visualize and verbalize for the moment. So you will see it's under tier two and tier three. And that's because a program isn't synonymous with a tier. A program really um, could be used in multiple tiers if it's being successful with a student. And so a student that's being successful with visual, visual, visualize and verbalize, um, so we're seeing games, but maybe not as quick as we would like, we could then say, okay, do we need to give it more frequently? So instead of, you know, 20 minutes every day, do we need to look at 40 minutes every day? Or if we've been giving it every other day, could we give it every day? Um, we could also look at the size of the group. So if you're working with a group of students that's between 10 and 12 students, we could say, what if we did a group that was around four students? Additionally, um, if a, a teacher is providing it, but they don't have a reading specialist certification, we could say, could the reading specialist provide the intervention? All of those things would make it more intense and that would be a tier three. And so I just wanted to, sometimes we just kind of put things in buckets, but the reality is there's a lot of things that would make something a tier three and it's not just what the name of the program is. Um, and then I guess the other slide we'll skip to and then I'll take questions is, uh, can we go to, um, all the way to, I think it's 23. Perfect. So the other thing I just want to talk about is we recognize that our core and intervention will only be as good as the integrity with which we are implementing them with. And so I know that everybody doesn't love the word fidelity. Um, and so we have transitioned a lot to the word integrity because what we want to do is saying, are we uh, using it in a way that aligns with how the publisher put it together. And therefore, we are implementing it with integrity. And so when we really think about that high quality implementation, that's an area that we have self-identified as an area of growth. And so we have really worked on ensuring that we are helping all schools, not only in their core, but in their interventions, deliver their core and interventions with integrity. And so we really have provided additional coaching professional learning, and we've also provided um, some checklists that will help as they are delivering that instruction. So I know I only have a few more minutes. I want to leave enough time for questions, so I'm going to pause there. Feel free to call out a slide. I'm certainly happy to go to any slide, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Um, board members, questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thanks. So, can we go to slide eight, a model of assessment driven instruction? And on this model, back, 
one, two more. Yeah, right there. So this model, it so it identifies that you're using map, the map assessment, dibbles. So on this core screening, this is the first le level of screening that Baltimore County is using to determine the the level of intervention that that may be needed for a student. Right. Yep. So we, yes, great. That is exactly what we're doing. That's what we call our universal screener. So we use MAP and or Dibbles or a mirror, depending on which one the school is using. And that would be a universal screener that just would tell us, hey, we might need some more information on this student. And so those assessments have been given for this year. So when will we see that data to know approximately how many students are going to be identified as perhaps this student needs more a deeper level of intervention. Do we have that data yet? Um, no, that's a great question. So we had actually extended the window to October 13th, um, which means that we give about two weeks after that date. So it actually will be this Friday that we will have the data cleaned up and then it moves over to Performance Matters. So at this point, we have not cleaned up the data, um, but that is something that um, typically we do put together. And even if I don't come back and present, we usually um, do a little synopsis that we send to you all that just kind of lets you see what the, that data is. And that data, um, particularly in our K-3, to uh, is part of our Ready to Read Act data. And so that is data that we collect anyway, and we would be happy um, to share that um, because we're almost at that point of being ready to share. So and it was Ms. Brooke Dreyer, just to the other part of the um, map assessment window just closed last Friday. So um, we're, we're right on the fringe of everything coming together to have that information for you guys. Perfect. Yes, I would love to see that map data, um, not just for K-3, but yes. um, you give the map all the way up to high school, to middle school. Mm -hmm. Yes. High school, then it's based, just curriculum-based assessments is what you all are using. That's correct. And so a curriculum-based assessment actually is a great way, again, as a universal screener to say, this is a student that we might need more information on. And so additionally, um, I don't know if you remember the slide that I showed how in focus we actually for our transition grades, we ensure as they move from eighth grade to ninth grade, we don't lose any student that is in need of intervention. So we already have that in place, but then you're right. Once they're in the high school, then what? It would actually be their curriculum based assessments that is giving us that information. And of course, in high school, we also have PSAT or ACT. You know, we have some additional data points that we look at um, and if they are not meeting um, the standard standard for college and career readiness, then we also know that's an indication that we need to provide additional support. Thanks. Yeah. I don't have more questions at this time. Okay. Um, Ms. Pomfrey, do you have a question? Uh-oh. I'll come back to you, Ms. Pomfrey. Ms. Stileski? Um, thank you. Thank you for such a comprehensive presentation. Um, I apologize. I don't have the slide numbers because I took notes earlier when I went through the PowerPoint. Um, so my only question, I'm assuming the universal screening um, would identify for each student whether they're tier one, tier two, or tier three. So, um, and so I just, I'm trying to understand. I know based on some of the reading scores that we've we've looked at, um, can you explain why it says 80 to 90% are at tier one? So how does that match some of the other data that we've seen where so many students are currently below grade, grade level? Yeah, so thank you. thank you for asking that question. And I think this is why Ms. Lichter does not like my triangle. Um, I don't want to speak for her, but um, this might be one of the reasons she doesn't like it because what I'm actually showing you in that triangle is what the national statistics would say if everything were in place perfectly or pretty perfectly um, that we would be able to serve 80 to 90 percent at core. We wouldn't need to intervene for, you know, that many students. Now, that is not our statistics in BCPS. We certainly, after this universal screener, um, Dr. DiDonato and I can put together a, a, a current state. Like, we can really give you, here's the current state of reading in BCPS, um, which will not, I will honestly, uh, um, what is it? Spoiler alert, it will not match that triangle. Yeah. Um, 
but you know, I think that here, here's the thing that you need to know about me is I'm only going to be honest with you all because the only way we can get better is if we're honest, right? And so are we where we should be? No. Um, do we have a lot of work to do? Yes. Or do we have people that are willing to push up their sleeves and get this work done? Yes. And so I feel like we are on a good path, um, but it will take time to get us to what that national normed average is. Um, but in the meantime, we can tell you where we are and what we plan to do to continue our path towards that um, like ideal state. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that oh. makes sense. Wait, I have a question. First, I'll have a comment. So I love the triangle and when <laughs> Baltimore County gets to the triangle, when our statistic, when our data matches it, I'll pay for t-shirts and we can all wear, you know, wear, wear the triangle. I think it's just like maybe the title, like that is what research shows will <laughs> Yeah, happen if we are effective, which is why the implementation of HMH is critical, because is. if your core is not implemented correctly, we're never going to have it. Um, the triangle work and we're going to have more and more kids who need tier two and tier three. So um, so I do like it. I just think that without that caveat, blur, yeah. it looks deceiving as to why if our data says X, does the triangle say that on slide 26? Um, where it talked about progress monitoring. Yeah. Give you a minute to get there. And also, thank you for the presentation and having it posted on board docs. I think it's very comprehensive for the public who want to really understand a little bit more about the different tiers and the interventions in it. It's it's a good one for them to kind of refer to. Um, OK, so on this page, you have progress monitoring and then it might have been the slide. Show me the slide after and before it. I can't. Mr. Horns. OK, the other way. OK, well, I'll just ask the question. So on this, so for progress monitoring, it's there written as two different things. One are the internal assessments that are included, and this is what this is showing, the, the assessments that go along with the programs and using those for progress monitoring. But you also, indicated Dibbles or Amira as another part of progress monitoring. So um, for people who are watching, can you explain why both and what the difference is between using internal um, assessments versus using Dibbles or Amira to do that progress monitoring? Um, such a good question. Uh, Mr. Corns, can you go forward? I think two slides just in, you know, people following along can see. Yeah, so um, so the internal ones by the vendors, um, sometimes, I mean, not that we're skeptical at all, but sometimes it feels like, well, they're, you know, they're like, well, this is what you should learn and we want our data to look good and we're, you know, we're, we want to, you know, so when um, students are taking it, sometimes we, while we like that data and it does show us when a student is making progress and not making progress, it's always good to have an external data source to say, is what they're doing in core or an in intervention, is it transferring to an external data? data source. And so um, schools this year um, could choose to use Dibbles or Amira. Um, and again, this is, you know, for our K to three uh, students. Um, and both of them really are collecting the same data and it's just the method of delivery that's different. Um, and so this is our first year using Amira. So it was an opt in. Uh, nobody had to do it. They could stay with Dibbles, which we've done for many, many, many years. Um, but what it's really doing is it it's seeing how students are reading um, and if they're making progress towards grade level mastery. So each of these programs has developed a set of criteria that will tell us how a student is doing in relation to what the grade level benchmark is. And so based on this screening, um, a student will either be not at risk, like we're not worried about them, or at risk, really at the, the highest level that, that those are the two buckets. Once a student is determined at risk, no matter how much at risk, once they're at risk, we do additional diagnostic testing because this only tells us so much. It tells us there's a problem. We don't know what the problem is. And so what will happen next is um, because it's the early grades, we will do the past or the beginning and advanced decoding survey to see is it decoding related? 
If the decoding seems pretty good and age appropriate, then we will do a comprehension screener to see is it a comprehension issue. Um, and I do want to say at this age, this K to three age, we always look at fluency also. And so that's why the or the oral reading fluency is so important is to see what the fluency is because we know that's kind of the link between decoding and comprehension is that the student is reading it fluently enough to be able to remember and articulate what they are reading. And so we use all of those. These are just the screeners to tell us like, hey, there might be a problem. Let's check out. Let's check into it a little bit more. Okay, thank you. I think it's just important that people, you know, we always hear too much assessments, but the progress monitoring is huge because we don't want to wait till mid-year or to the end of the year. We want that more updated information so that we can adjust. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, do you have another question? I do have a follow-up on this slide. So with the data from Amira, you, you said that, okay, it tells you kind of where the students are. I see above, but I see the red, yellow, and uh, green. Yes. You can uh, get, go deeper with that data to find out specifically what are the skills, the concepts, because what yeah. if I understand what you just said, so you, you realize a student is in yellow and then you give them another assessment to determine if it's comprehension or if it's, could you just explain a little bit because to make sure that I, I did not misunderstand because it sounded like they you're identified through a mirror and then you determine through a, another assessment if it's decoding or comprehension or something like that. Is that what's happening? Yeah, so both um, Dibbles and Amira would be falling into the category of being a universal screener. And so that's really just an indication that a student isn't on the what we would say the correct trajectory to meet the end of year target, right? Now, there's a lot of things that can happen over the course of the year, but in that moment when they took that assessment for the couple of minutes that they took it, it shows that there might they might not be uh, meeting the end of year target, right? And what we know is that that reading on grade level by grade three is huge. And so we don't want to make we want to make sure that in every um, and we actually do it three times a year that they are on track to meet that end of year target. And so if they um, are not on track, we do additional screening um, to drill down a little bit further. Um, and this uh, makes sure that we give them the correct intervention. Because when we go to give a student an inter intervention, the only way it's going to work is if we're intervening in the right way. And so a lot of times when we think about reading, um, it can be lots of different things. So right now I even just talked about three things I talked about. We could be talking about decoding. We could talk, be talking about fluency. We could be talking about comprehension or a combination of them. Um, and so the, we want to drill down to a more finite level um, where we get additional details about what the student is missing because within the bucket of decoding, there's a lot, right? So are we talking monosyllabic words versus multisyllabic words? Are we talking, you know, like what is it that we are really needing to work on? Um, we won't get that level of deal, uh, detail from Amira because remember, like for both uh, Dibbles and Amira, we're talking like a, a five minute, you know, um, assessment. And so the additional assessments give us exactly what do we need to do with the student um, so that we can close the gaps that exist. So that's what it's doing is providing some additional information to make sure that we're intervening in the right way. So we're spending less time in intervention and more time in core. And so how does this fit into the 2% cap with testing the state uh, law that so you test them here and then they're tested again. I don't know. I I got I got to sit and reflect on this because it just it I get into screener. Um, I I'll come back. I'll come back. I need to I'll, sit and reflect on this some more because it just yeah. feels like it, let let's give them the test that they need to get the information. Let's give them the test that's going to give us the information that we need. If all Amir is, is giving us is colors and these students are in this color and this group, these students are in that color, and then we got to test again, is this the right screener um, for? I don't know. I just, I need to think about this some more because it just, it seems like it's a lot of testing. And then is that five minute screener then, is that enough for, to truly make that assessment of a student? Um, I don't know. I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll hold off for now. Okay, um, so the um, 
so yes, please, please keep asking questions and feel free to also email me. You don't have to wait till the next curriculum committee meeting. Um, but what I would offer is that it does do a, a lot of things just to determine if a student is or is not at risk, um, but it doesn't do everything to provide the intervention that they need. Um, but to answer your the other question, which is we calculate all minutes of all assessments into that 2%. So we go through, we list all the assessments that are used. So, you know, everything gets does get counted and we're very aware of that 2% cap. Ms. Demonowski, you have a question? Yes, um, mine was just um, looking over um, the uh, AMIR assessment and being compliant with COMAR's Ready to Read Act. Is is AMIR um, a a tool that I mean, is it compliant with with the Ready to Read Act when it, it says that it's you know it's supposed to be processed with a, a basically a teacher? I just wanted to make sure that we're on it's if if it has been accepted as something for that as compliant with Ready to Read. Yes, thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Mm. It is on the MSDE approved screener list, um, and I can I can actually provide that um, for you all if you want to see the the list. Yeah, that would be. It's just a question I've I've been getting, and I, I yeah. didn't know how to answer it. So thank you. Of course, Ms. Pumphrey, I'm going to go back to you. Did you still have a question and volume? Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, we can. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, so part of my question was already asked, um, but I'm going back to the infamous pyramid here. Um, so you answered, or we talked about how this pyramid isn't reflective. I'm talking about um, slide 10, by the way. It isn't reflective of where we are currently. So my question is, um, since we likely have way more students in Tier 3 than what this pyramid is showing us here, um, how, do we know how many of our teachers are trained um, in in this tier three in the you know this tier three comprehension and decoding interventions? Um, I will you, just to save time. I, I was about to to grab a screen uh, my spreadsheet, but uh, to save time, what I can do is do that in a follow up email to let you know um, who's trained. But also, I will let you know that we continually offer these interventions. Like I know we're having, even though we had visualized and verbalized in the summer, we have another one coming up in November. So we constantly and the OG has been kind of a, a like multiple um, cohorts um, throughout this year. So I would say I can get. You you that number and we continue to offer trainings. Okay, and just another quick question that you can add to that if you can't answer right away about the Wilson. I think we were told that Wilson um, teachers were not trained in that or not certified in that. Is that correct? So um, to be trained to teach the program, anybody that um, is teaching the program should be trained. The certification is another level um, that we do not have very many. Um, in fact, I think most of the people that certified, which is that really intense um, 109 hours maybe, um, that's off the top of my head, but um, there we did have a couple people along the way, but people move and change districts and things like that. So we don't have anybody we do. We have purchased seats so that when we do find somebody that is interested in it and we've been looking at ways to incentivize that, um, that we do have slots available for somebody to actually become uh, fully certified. OK, so when we had that listed up here as part of our decoding intervention, that's because teachers are some teachers are in that intro to have that intro training, but not but are not certified in to teach, yes. correct? So so Wilson um, actually once you take that introductory training, they do say you are trained to teach the program. As with anything that you get more in depth with, um, obviously you become better at it and you are, you know, um, you are more able to um, make uh, what I would call those micro decisions that are so important in the moment decisions. Um, however, Wilson does give you a certificate to teach after you do that introductory training. Um, and we also do provide coaching um, throughout the year for our Wilson teachers um, as we still strive to get people that do the, the full certification process. Okay, as you can imagine, my concern is that we, you know, looking at this, this pyramid, we have many more students in this top level tier than what is kind of visualized here as we as we discussed. It's sort of like this is where we want to be, but it's not where we are. Um, and, I, you know, I don't want to say this, but I feel this way that by far we're not anywhere close to this right now. Um, and so 
you know, just back to the training and using that word, infamous word fidelity, you know, if we're not, I don't know, I'm just concerned about the training here for this, for these tier level tier three interventions that we probably have way more students than what sort of is shown as under 5%. On yeah. The level. And it's more of a comment. I know you probably don't have an answer for me, but I mean, we're all here for the same reason that we want our oh, students yeah. to be able to read. Um, okay. And we have this new reading curriculum and I'm, I'm feeling hopeful and positive about it, but we can't forget about the students who maybe are really far from being at that level at this point and need interventions to bring them up to where they need to be. I 100% agree with you, um, and you're right. We are all all here partnering in the same work for in service of our students. And one of the things I'll say about Wilson, and I, I'm saying something that like is directly on their page, but they're like, we are, you know, built around the principles of structured literacy and and um, principles from Orton Gillingham. So I guess I would also offer that even if they haven't been through the 109 hours of the Wilson certification program, but if they're OG trained or if they've taken a courses in structured literacy, that they do have expert knowledge. And so when we talk about going from a tier two to a tier three, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, that it's not just about the program. Sometimes it is the program, but it really has to do with the intensity in which we're offering it. And part of the intensity is who is offering that intervention. And so when we have a student that needs tier three, I would offer that that should be the reading specialist or the person that has the most specialized training because we're trying to close the gap as quickly as possible. So the the uh, the way that we can do that is by making sure that we have the most trained practitioner in front of those students. And so um, that's the nice thing about Wilson is it's drawing on principles from OG and structured literacy. And so it isn't a one size fits fits all. If we have a, a teacher that's done OG, they're going to implement Wilson better. If they've done structured literacy training, they're going to implement Wilson better. And so I think part of that is making sure that we are continuing to offer training and we're also in incentivizing our teachers to take that training and the part later in the presentation, oh, we're, we're, we're still there, the progress monitoring. And so I think that when we talk about our tier three students, the, that progress monitoring is essential. We have to make sure that our students are making progress because if they're not, then we need to go back and look at all those different things. Why is the student not making progress? We don't want to wait till the end of the year and say, oh, this student didn't, didn't make progress with this intervention. We want to be able after 10 or 12 weeks to say, are they starting to respond? You know, what else can we do? How can we support it? And so I think there's a lot of variables that we're really trying to tighten up and do better. Okay. All right. I think we will. We could probably do a couple more hours on this one um, topic, but um, for the sake of time, we'll move on to the next one. But I think we should circle back to it as like you said in the beginning, as more data points um, are cleaned up and put together so we can monitor um, you know, how things are going. So this won't be the last on this topic. I think it's kind of the intro on it and we will continue to you know, talk about it throughout the school year. We don't need a motion. This was just an informational topic that our committee had requested. So I'm going to move on to something else we had requested, which is a more information about the blueprint. At our last board meeting two weeks ago, um, pillar one was a focus of one of the presentations. So we had said that we would listen to that and then send any follow-up questions to Dr. DiDonato. And I'm not sure if you got any, Dr. DiDonato. No, it was such a thorough and wonderful presentation that you answered our questions. And it was, it was very detailed and you did have a lot of information in it. But does anybody, um, so we didn't send any, does anybody have any last minute questions that they wanna to, want to ask of the team? Okay, all right, now we can always come back. Because it's it's all these are all moving target not target I hate to say targets these are all moving somethings um, pieces, so, pieces 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 right and I think Dr. Um, Rogers has also the idea of coming back around so um, at tomorrow night's meeting we have another pillar um, I think that one's more of the highly qualified teacher piece um, all to me all the pillars are going to overlap on curriculum committee some way um, some stronger than others but. So we'll do the same thing. We'll see if there's any questions um, that you want answered at our next meeting um, in November. And we have one more um, topic, book selection and review process. So we will discuss book selection and review. And for that, I will call on 
Dr. Donato and Ms. Lanza. Um, did I say that right? Did I pronounce that name right? Somebody help me. Lanza. Lanza. Lanza, okay. I want now from now on all vowels phonetically like laid out for me so that I can stop messing up people's names. So, um, okay, it's all yours. Okay, so this was a topic um, again requested with regards to um, school library selection process. I know we've had lots of questions as far as book selection process, curriculum selection, um, and this is hopefully a way for us to really lay out the a little bit of the difference between the school library book selection process and the overall curriculum instructional materials that are used universally throughout the system um, process. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ms. Lanza. Thank you. So moving on to our very first slide, we're going to start with our state expectations. So starting with Comar, um, library materials can meet curricular and instructional goals by increasing student literacy, engagement, and reading enhancement. To ensure access to quality library media collections, a systemic process for, ac for assessing and building library media collections is essential. And so if you look um, for COBAR, the, those are the, the regulations that are in place. So knowing that we need to have an organized and centrally managed collection of instructional materials, we know that that's going to be our school library collection. Knowing that instruction emphasizing information literacy skills, so our library media specialists are teachers. They do instruct um, students. It looks different at the elementary level than it does at the secondary level. Um, we know that they're looking at appropriate materials and technologies, um, so a lot of times helping to inform on the technology that is also used, meaning like databases or digital content for those instructional programs. And then most importantly, knowing that we need to have a certified school library media um, specialist for each one of our school library collections. And so if we move on, we'll look at what we currently are following in our Baltimore County Public Schools um, beyond Comar. So currently right now, our best, our current practices for collection development are in alignment with BCPS policy 6200, which is instructional services, school libraries, and rule 6002, instruction, selection of instructional materials. A proposed rule 6200 6, is currently being developed to more accurately align the collection development process for school libraries and to remove the direct connection to instructional materials. While we know that school library materials often are selected on topics that are in the instruction, they're not required reading and are not required um, as part of the curriculum. So we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to, um, to better align um, the actual work of the school library collections. And we believe that this rule that is currently being prepared will better articulate the processes in place to select, deselect, and reconsider school library materials. And so moving on to our next slide, we are going to kind of outline the rest of the presentation. So after teaching and instruction, collection development is the most significant work of a school library media specialist. In all Baltimore County Public Schools, um, school library media specialists are either certified or are working towards certification for school library. The coursework taken in either a master's degree program or a post baccalaureate certificate program provide training and maintaining a school library collection. So we'll highlight the collection development plan, selection criteria, professional learning, and the audit processes during the remainder of this presentation. So we'll go ahead and move on to the collection development cycle. Um, so trying to put together the collection development cycle in kind of um, the most simplistic way is what you're going to be seeing on the screen, but I'm going to talk through each of those pieces in a little bit more detail. So the collection development cycle is ongoing. Um, we have kind of a set one in Baltimore County due to the way that the funding is released, um, but we're going to talk through each one of those pieces on the next slide. So the school library collection is a living resource that is constantly in flux and needs attention from a certified and highly trained professional. So if we look um, at that very first piece, the gray piece that's um, for funding provided, I don't know if we can move on to the next slide. Perfect, thanks. Um, so library media specialists receive centralized funding from our office, the Office of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology to purchase school library materials. 
And I just want to take this opportunity to thank the board for their ongoing commitment to providing funding to make sure that our library collections can be maintained and enhanced each year. That's really exciting for us and it's nice for our school library media specialists as well as our school based staff to know that they're not needing to find money to enhance their collections and update them, but that the school actually the school board actually guarantees that funding for it. So thank you for that. So prior to our office um, allotting funding to any of our schools, each school library media specialist completes a yearly collection development plan, and that plan helps them to analyze the needs of the school community and their school library collection. We'll talk about that a little bit further on one of our um, additional slides. Then the library media specialist selects um, materials following the selection criteria and guidelines, which again we'll cover a little bit later in this presentation. The library media specialist self audit, so they, they identify that they are meeting all of the selection criteria that we have in place. And then all new and non certified library media specialists are audited by a leader in the Office of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology to ensure that the selection criteria and guidelines are followed. And then feedback is provided to support the growth of the new or non certified library media specialist about their order. Then the collection development orders are placed from one or both of our contracted vendors. And then the library media specialists receive their book shelf ready, and that means that they have spine labels. It means that they have barcodes and their records are in the online public access catalog. And this ensures that that books can be immediately shelved and checked out to students when they arrive to that library. And then finally, library media specialists remove, we deselect, all those terms are kind of used in, interchangeably in the library world, damaged or worn copies to make room for those newly selected materials. And so deselection of school library materials are an integral part of collection development. It's essential that libraries evaluate the quality and content of all materials or remove anything that's old, outdated, worn, damaged, or redundant. And we, um, of course, have system level selection guidelines, and there's also national strategies for removing items from the collection. So looking a little bit farther into that collection development plan, the annual collection, de collection development plan is required by all school library media specialists. The plan includes the sections that are on the screen, the school analysis, collection analysis, collection analysis by category, which is going to be what's shown here on the screen, so the different Dewey um, areas or fiction, um, graphic novels, those areas, collection analysis reflection, and collection analysis planning guide, and then the executive summary. So the plan facilitates the curation and analysis of data to identify opportunities for growth and deselection in library collections. The plan is read and reviewed by the school principal and a leader in the Office of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology. In order to be responsive to the unique needs of each school, a collection development process must be in place and must be based on analysis of student needs at a particular school. So there will be some similarities among library collections across the county, but the profile provided by the analysis will ensure that the specific needs of each school are addressed. Collection assessment is needed to determine the quality of the existing library collection. It's an organized method for collecting statistics on the age of the collection, the number of titles in the collection, and the ability of the collection to meet the needs of our students. And so moving on to the next slide, um, the BCPS equity policy is the foundation of our collection development. We're charged to select materials and provide environments that reflect and support the diversity of the student population, the families in our system, and the community at a whole. We value the importance of providing materials that reflect the diversity of students and staff and gear toward understanding and appreciating culture, class, language, ethnicity, ability, and other differences. You'll see these ideas reflected in the selection criteria for our school library materials, which will be on the next slide. So we're going to have lots of boxes. Um, these are our current selection criteria, and so um, looking at appropriate for the recommended levels, we'll go into a little bit more detail about that on the, the following slide. We know that they need to have some materials in the library collection that are related to the curriculum, right? If there's a magnet program at that school that um, we want to make sure that we have a really robust library collection in those areas to support our students. They need to be accurate in terms of content, which is where it's going to be really appropriate that as we're selecting titles that we're able to read reviews to learn more about what the content of the book may entail, 
looking at the copyright, identifying the, um, the publishers um, as well to help us understand the authority of that content. Reflective of the plural, pluralistic nature of a global society. So this goes back to the equity policy we talked about. Free of bias and stereotype, representative of different viewpoints on controversial subjects. Appropriate format to teach, effectively teach the curriculum. This is one of those pieces where we talked, we're trying to better align between a curriculum resource and a library material resource. So this is one that we'll definitely be reviewing. Recent copyright as appropriate to the subject, and we'll dig a little bit more into copyright and how that's important in our school library collections on a further slide. Acceptable in literary style and technical quality, and then appropriate for various learning needs. So the current selection criteria for BCPS school library collections, as I mentioned, a revised versions currently been being written to better differentiate school library collection materials from instructional materials. School library materials may be selected and utilized to support curriculum topics, units, and standards, but are not required resources for curriculum. And so all purchases, so that includes that cycle we talked about with the funding that is part of our centralized budget, um, or any purchases with school level funds, or any gifts or donations, all of those, um, any item going into the school library collection have to meet the selection criteria that's posted on the screen. And so let's take a little bit further into the idea of, um, of looking at the, uh, the reviews or the age appropriateness of a title. So on the next screen, you're going to have an opportunity to see a snapshot of one of our approved, um, one of our contracted vendors where you can actually see that there are full text reviews that are available for a library media specialist to read because library media specialists aren't able to read every title prior to purchasing for the library collection. Therefore, reading reviews from reputable sources such as Library Journal, Booklist, Hornbook, School Library Journal, Kirkus Reviews, and various awards that are granted provide additional information about the content, accuracy, format, and age appropriateness of a book. So you may not be able to see on your screen, it's kind of tiny. At the very beginning of the review, you can see that it has the age range that's recommended by um, this particular reviewer. You can see the reviews and the awards that were also mentioned. Um, and so this is just a screenshot. There's additional reviews that are listed below, but to help you to better understand what type of reviews might be used in order to help select a title. If reviews aren't available in one of those two um, contracted vendors, which are Fall at Tidal Wave and Bound to Stay Bound, there are additional sources that can be used. And so a couple of recommendations could be that the library media specialist can search the BCPS online public access catalog, which is called Destiny, to identify which other schools in their um, levels, so elementary, elementary, middle, middle, or high, high, have that title and then actually reach out to that library media specialist to get to gather feedback or ask to review that book um, to you know borrow that copy to review for themselves. They can also review a, a book um, from the Baltimore County Public Library. We have a great uh, connection with our Baltimore County Public Library and we know that there's lots of branches around our county. So physically going to a branch, looking at a book, flipping through it would be another recommendation. And then also a lot of times there's Google preview available for a book, which will allow you to flip through the book to learn a little bit more about it without actually having it in your hands. And then looking at the next slide, talking more about age appropriateness. American Library Association defines young adult or YA as individuals between 12 and 18 years of, of age. Therefore, if you look at the, um, the first box, YA titles are not permitted in elementary school collections based upon that recommendation about that age range. Library media specialists are asked to pay attention to the age and grade levels of characters in a book when making a decision to select YA for middle school. Um, 12 to 18 certainly does include middle school students, but we're always asking them to pay attention to the age of the characters or the grade level of the characters to see if that's something that the, the students would be able to relate to. And then the majority of a high school library collection would be YA titles, um, but adult titles are permitted for high school library collections as long as those reviews we just talked about or awards mention the appropriateness for high school students. So it would have to include that high school age, age as well. And then we've talked a lot about print books, but if we look at the next slide, um, there's also non-print books as part of our school library collection. So school library collections consist of print and non-print materials, and library media specialists are encouraged to purchase non-print materials such as ebooks, 
audiobooks and interactive books to provide support to all learner preferences. We know that non-print books often provide read aloud features, videos, links, and translation to support our students. And all ebooks have specialized features to support readers such as highlighting text, adjusting font, taking the ability to take notes, and there's many more. And many curriculum topics or titles will be purchased as ebooks to support um, to, to support that in our school library collections. And then just like we talked about, um, all previous selection criteria would also apply to the non-print books. And then if we move on to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about copyright. So copyright and publishing dates provide details about the time in which a book was written. It also helps with nonfiction book topics. They have recommended refresh timelines depending upon the content of the book. For example, a book about countries needs to be updated more frequently to identify an increase in population, the new leadership, etc. But a book about caring for dogs needs to be updated less frequently um, unless new information on that topic is discovered. So it's un I'm unable to say what the exact age is for each one of the different types of nonfiction books. But if you look on the screen, here's a few that are examples of, of, um, of books that would be, need to be updated in a school library collection. For example, plagues, we know that that's something that is often covered in curriculum topics. And so books about plagues have been updated now to include COVID. So we want to make sure that there was some updated resources around that topic. Books about smoking, again, we know that that's often covered in health curriculum, have now been updated to also include vaping. So that would be an example of a need for um, a newer updated copyright version. And then books about the solar system several years ago were updated to remove Pluto as a planet. Um, so we know that those books also needed to be updated as well. And so when we the screenshot that you're looking at is as a library media specialist is building a list that they would like to order, they can actually look at the list that they're building and look at the average age for each one of the sections. You can see for the nonfiction, it breaks it down by Dewey. Uh, you can also see biography, easy, which is our picture books, and then fiction as well. So there's lots of tools to help them with this strategy. Moving to the next slide, talking about professional learning. Library media specialists engage in quarterly professional learning facilitated by leaders in the Office of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology. The professional learning is also advised by the members of our Library Leadership Council. The Library Leadership Council is a yearly selected group of library media specialists that meet monthly to discuss, plan, and implement professional learning and to discuss trends in school libraries. This year, there are 18 members, including all school, school levels and ge geographic areas of the county. So the collection development plan is reviewed annually during professional learning to include best practices and any updates. New library media specialists, so those are either new to our school system or are um, new to becoming a library media specialist, engage in a series of professional learning called New Librarians Academy. One session is focused on selection of titles and another provides support for completing the collection development plan. Soft censorship is a nationally trending topic that has surfaced due to the increase of book challenges. Soft censorship focuses on, on, on addressing internal biases and external for forces that may cause a library media specialist to not select a book that meets selection criteria. And so the, the pie chart that's there at the bottom, the Maryland Association of School Librarians reported approximately 52% of the Maryland School Library Media Specialists they surveyed stated that they have engaged in soft censorship. So that continues to be a topic that we address with our library media specialists through professional learning. Moving on to the next slide, talking a little bit more about the audit process. Um, the audit process was initiated during the 2014-2015 collection development cycle. And then the self audit process was initiated during the 2021-2022 school year to ensure that all library media specialists properly reviewed orders for alignment with selection criteria. So as a reminder, all new and non-certified library media specialists are audited and they're audited by a leader in the Office of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology. Um, and then we take a snapshot of elementary, middle and high high school orders to also audit. So just to give you a little bit of data, during the 2021-2022 school year, 25 schools were audited and 22, 23, 33 schools were audited. The image that's on 
the screen is going to be an example of the self audit. So essentially we're asking our library media specialists before they place their order to look again at their list and make sure that they have followed the selection criteria. So the first one talks about which areas did you select from lower elementary, upper elementary, YA. So again, we're getting back to that, that um, the age appropriateness we talked about. So we would not expect to see YA or adult checked on an elementary school. Um, so that's part of that self audit process. And then on the right hand side, um, we provide videos to help remind them about how they can use some of the different features that are in our two contracted vendors to help them with this work and then ask them to identify which of the features that they use in order to help them um, actually craft and create their order. And then to kind of start to wrap this all up on the next slide, we talked about um, the need to to create a rule for 6200. Right now, the reconsideration process we're using is from um, curriculum and instruction 6002. And so that is the process that we currently use. But moving forward, we know that we really need a reconsideration process that is better aligned and developed to actual school library media collections instead of instructional materials. Um, and then we're also working on a parent form, which will allow um, parents to identify specific titles that are currently in their school library collection that they would like their child to not um, check out from the library. And so um, library media specialists would be able to utilize Destiny, which is our online public access catalog, to note those parent requests for specific titles. And we think both of these, um, these next steps will help reduce the amount of book challenges that are currently happening in Baltimore County Public Schools. And so our final slide before we get to um, any questions is just a little bit of understanding about book reconsiderations um, and BCPS across the state and then also national trends. And so nationally books about race, racism, LGBTQ plus identities and violence remain a top target of the book banning movement in 2023. And these topics hold true for the books that have gone through the reconsideration process in our school system. So a little bit of data about BCPS, how many titles have been reconsidered since 2018, 2019. Just want to make sure in case you can't see the asterisk. In 2020, 2021, there were six titles that were actually reconsidered. Um, but then we found out that there were some books that were in Spanish that were the exact same story. So then that, you know, just because it's in another language, it of course then needed to be removed as well. And then there were some of those stories that were in a compilation. So again, anytime that story that was reconsidered also had to be removed. So 11 titles total, but it was six titles um, originally. And then again, we saw that survey from the Maryland Association of School Librarians. So they were able to um, conduct a survey this past year. And so 20 counties reported um, book challenges and zero private schools reported book challenges from that survey. And then nationally from the American Library Association, you can see in 2020, uh, 223 challenges were reported, and in 2022, 2,571 challenges were reported. Which takes us to our end. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about our current processes and where we're going um, to better understand how selection um, happens for school libraries. And um, I'll take it back to Ms. Donato or Dr. Donato. I don't know if we have time for questions, but we are here. <laughs> Um, thank, you thank you for your presentation. Um, it was extremely thorough, but I'm pretty sure my group would have some questions. So um, any questions concerning the presentation or? Um, Ms. Teles, whoops, um, what we do? OK, Ms. Um, Dominowski, do you have a question? Yes, I do, but I, I can wait. It's not up. Well, just, there are two quick questions. I'll go fast. Um, do we have a separate section in our libraries for um, specifically adult content titles? Like anything that would be labeled uh, inappropriate for anyone under the age of 18? The only schools that would have adult titles would be our high schools, but they would have to be classified as adult for young adults. So they would have to have that age range of an adult of a high school student. So. Um, if I'm understanding your question, no, we don't have an adult section in any of our libraries. So what would be the process for evaluating books that have a content warning label on it? So we have, we have several books in our libraries that have a content warning label that advise against um, consumption by um, young adults under the age of 18. So I'm wondering where those books go. 
I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, I'm not aware of the titles that you're speaking of, um, but again, if it well, I mean any title, any title that has that content warning on it that advises against um, the consumption of anyone under the age of 18, do we have a process for that? Um, if I'm understanding correctly, it doesn't sound like it would have passed all the selection criteria. I would need to have those two positive reviews for the age range. Um, so I, I can I can certainly talk about that a little bit more after I have a chance to to understand more about those titles, but I, I can't speak any more to that right now. I'm sorry, uh, I'm, my husband took my oldest to soccer and I'm having him get out now. OK, you have to come back to me. OK, um, Miss Booker Dwyer. And so uh, thank you for this thorough presentation. Uh, what is the age range and criteria for a book to be classified as a young adult? So I'm going to go back to my notes because I pulled that from the American Library Association. Give me one second. According to the American Library Association, they define young adult as between 12 and 18 years of age. And so, and so 12 to 18, and then so an adult 18 and over, older. When you, in one of your slides, you had uh, the phrase with caution. It was, um, I, I for, uh, slide 10, where it was the application of criteria. And um, you said the young adult titles are permitted with caution for age appropriateness. So what do you mean by with caution? Is that, could you just explain a little bit what you mean by that? Yeah, so we talked a little bit more about thinking about the age of the characters and the grade level of the characters to understand whether or not a middle school student would be able to relate to those experiences. And so some school systems I know um, in their policies, it's, it's a little bit more explicit. And maybe this is when we get to, um, you know, the policy that, that we're using where they even go down to saying that, okay, if the book is in alignment with um, like what would be considered rated PG-13 um, for a movie, uh, that there would be some connection there because there are some pretty graphic um, novels in our libraries that I wonder if they were to put this into a movie and would we allow that to be shown in school? And so I, I almost feel like sometimes there's this discrepancy with, okay, we would, we allow this book to be put on the shelf. It's over 18 and it could be a rated R book, for instance, but we would never show a rated R movie in school. And so it just, it feels like there is this disconnect. Um, I think that's what Ms. Dominowski was, was getting at, that there are some very graphic content and images in some of the, the reading materials for high school. And I just feel like if we're not gonna show the rated R movie, if we would never allow that in school, then is it okay then to say let's put that book in there with that same graphic content that may classify it as a rated r so i feel like that's what the the disconnect is um for me when it comes to this to, to these books so i guess my question is um how do we write that or how can we at least ensure that we're informing parents that okay there's adult titles in the high school that may have some explicit content in it. Like how are we building the parents' capacity to understand so that they can make an informed decision for their child? So I think, so, go ahead. Okay. So um, I, I think it's really important, um, just using your example, because that, that really helps me to clarify the question, is that school library materials are self-selected. So students have the option to self-select whether or not they would like to read this book or check out the book. Showing a video to an entire class would be a selection by an educator. And so I think it's really important to think about the difference that having a book on the shelf makes it accessible to our students. We've already identified that it's age appropriate because it meets our selection criteria. So again, if it's an adult title, it still has to have the reviews that mention that it's appropriate for the age range of our students at the high school which you know, any student then would be able to check out, but it's not required reading, which would be kind of that example of showing a movie, is that then a student is sitting in a space in which a movie is shown that they don't necessarily have the choice whether or not they would like to watch that. But is it okay to show a rated, I guess my core question is, is it, is it okay to show a rated R movie in school? 
per high school. And if Baltimore County says yes, then okay, then fine, keep those adult titles, we're good to go. There's parity there. But if it's not okay to show a rated R movie in school, then the question becomes, is, then is it okay to have a book that may be, have rated R content? If that book was turned into a movie, would that be okay? So that's the core of my question. Like we, we have to be consistent in our messaging and, and clear. And so if we're saying that this graphic image would not be okay for a teacher to show that in the classroom, but it's okay for students self-selects it and picks it on its own, we'll still put that in our libraries and students can have access to it. So I guess that's what I'm trying to write because I feel like that is the core of the argument that we constantly hear. And so I'm just wondering how is Baltimore County trying to write that? I'm all for students having access to whatever books they want, but then if that's the case, then put the rated R movies and let them have access to that too, because that's what we're essentially saying. So I, I think, Ms. Booker Dreyer, I think the, the real difference is like the adult requiring a student or an adult making a student watch a movie. We're not having, teachers are not doing read alouds. Like there, if there is a adult, uh, you know, text again it, it is about that more that selection process so if a child chooses to take their phone out during lunch let's just because it happens in school cafeterias right and they put on some video they're choosing to to watch that and so we're not teachers aren't having them watch it we're not asking school administrators to ask them to watch something that would be r-rated and so i think but what i i'm hearing you say and part of the going back to the rule behind 6,200 uh, 6, um, is that 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 specific delineation of those pieces you know the policy is the big global part from from the board and the rule really defines that there is no rule that really spells out these pieces which again listening to you know some of your your questions um, that is something that you know as the committee is looking at developing a rule to really consider all these pieces of information um, and these different kind of considerations um, if there's another LEA in Maryland that has a rule that sort of def gives that delineation, I'd be curious to read it, like that kind of like a connection between like the adult book and a, like a rated R movie. I would just love to hear their wording and how like they're explaining that. Um, please shoot me an email, let me know. I will. Howard County is one that has one of their policies um, and they, they say that it makes a connection like this. Okay. Right. So that's one of the ones that. OK, perfect. Was, if it's PG high school, they only allow PG 13 PG G. And it and it feels like for Baltimore County, we're allowing PG 13 R and maybe more. Which is, um, you know, OK, we want to do that, but let's just be consistent throughout our messaging. Um, that, that's my, that's my mm -hmm. core. And then I, I heard the, the last part of your question was, how are we notifying parents? Um, just a reminder that our online public access catalog, Destiny, is open access, meaning that anybody can go in and look to see what titles are in each of our school libraries. Um, so that would be something I would recommend if, if that's not something that people are aware of. I know you can directly get there from our office website, the Office of Library Media Programs and Instructional Technology. Ms. Stileski, did you have a question or comment? You're I think you muted, you muted yourself. You're, sorry, um, just a quick comment. This presentation was really thorough. I wonder if there's a way to just do some kind of public service announcement to sort of announce to the to the community that um, to, to lay out the process a bit, maybe not as detailed as this, but to lay out the process and just that friendly reminder that destiny is public. Um, and then just going along with Ms. Booker Dwyer's concern, um, you know, we do hear a lot about some of the very sexually suggestive and um sexual acts in some of the books and maybe something that we do have to look at and explore is kind of evaluating is that appropriate in high school um and and then if it's if we if, if it's decided that it's not maybe it's reevaluating some of the novels in high school that may be giving a message that students might read on their own, but we just wouldn't want them checking out those books from their high school. Just like 
on their own, they might watch a rated R movie, but just something that we're not going to put in the value system of the high school um, curriculum. Um, so just some thoughts and then just a quick question about the reviews. So the two required reviews, is it required that the reviews just provide an overall um, overall view of the book? Or is it required that the review um, like portrays that the book is OK for whatever level of school level of school, elementary, middle or high that the book would be used for in Baltimore County? Great question. There, there have to be two positive reviews for the age range. So okay. each of the reviews will recommend an age range. Um, so some of them might give a grade level range. Some of them might give an age range. So that's just that's that just depends on their structure. Um, but they do have to have they do have to be positive. A lot of times, especially in nonfiction titles, there will be reviews that aren't positive because they'll talk about captions not matching um, the images or that the the, um, the words get lost in the gutter, which is like, you know, the inside of the book that you can't read it. So reviews will call out and they're not all positive. Um, so they will call out um, an overview of the book. A lot of times it talks about um, opinions of the writers, but there's always an age range. And that's what we're requiring is the age range for that area. OK, okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not possible to get the two reviews, is there some kind of documentation that the librarian would have to provide to show the alternative to the second review? So that's a great or question. It, or is it more like loosey goosey that they would then use some of those other strategies that you mentioned? Great question. So there's a notes feature in our ordering system. So Tidal Wave is the, the most commonly one used, which is Fall Out. The other one's Bound to Stay Bound, where they are asked to put where they found um, the reviews for any book that didn't have the two positive reviews. Um, so that is, that is a process in place and that would be something that we would, you know, really articulate in that new rule that we're trying to propose. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, I just have a quick logistics question because I haven't looked at Destiny in a while. In Destiny, does it distinguish, like does it note that these are young adult books? It's like, is YA classified anywhere? Uh, it's a great question. I don't have Destiny up right now. <laughs> I might need to uh, to go in and do a little bit more looking for that. The reason I'm asking is just when we say that parents have access to Destiny and it's public, I mean, I'm sure there's hundreds and hundreds of books listed on there. So is there a way that it would kind of highlight to a high school parent, these books are young adult books, which you know may then lend to more of the content that everybody else has been speaking to? But we can get back so, with that. That's fine. So, Ms. Lecter, also to that point, though, the books in Destiny are linked to that school. So, if your child goes to Perry Hall Middle and you're looking there, you would only see the books that are in the Perry Hall Middle School's right. library. So, that also will help parents to like narrow, narrow right. a little bit. It's not like every book in the entire system. I mean, it's all, they're all in there, but they're. Right, it's already Link filtered down school. for their, yeah. their school, right. So I'm wondering if there's a filter for young adults or um, we heard content warning label or adult, I mean, some of those labels that people are talking about. If yeah. I was a parent, I just wanted to know if those books for my kids' library, is there an easy way to do that? Um, Ms. Pumphrey, do you have a question? I have a question that I'm not sure if you can answer. So um, is there actually a standard system for of content warning labels for books? because I'm not aware there is a standard for that. I'm not aware. Um, OK, so if uh, let's just say for argument of sake, there is actually a standard content warning label for books, which I don't believe there is, but I'm going to ask anyway. If there was a standard warning label that said the book wasn't recommended for students under 18, then would it be suffice to say that book would not be in one of our high school libraries? My guess is there wouldn't be two positive reviews that would be found for it to be like that, that high school age, age range, correct. Yeah. OK, thank you. Ms. Demonowski, are you able to finish your question? Yeah, yes, I got them settled down. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I can um, show you several examples of books in our libraries that have a content warning, and there is a content warning um, uh, standard for books for 18 year olds and older. And in that, um, 
and that light or I would like to make a motion here um, for I'd like to make a motion that we ask PRC and staff to review policy 6002 as well as while discussing the new library materials policy 600 to consider including a provision that restricts explicit sexual contact content in our instructional materials. PRC and staff should also consider including a clear definition of explicit sexual content based on federal and state laws, as well as SCC standards, decency standards. <clears throat> Okay, there seems to be a lot of motions in that motion. Um, so it's once it's one motion. Do you want me to repeat it? I can put it in the chat if you want. Yeah, why don't you? I think it's important that you put it in the chat so that we're all able, able to read it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a long one. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. While Ms. Domenowski is doing that, do any board members have any other questions? And then we'll come back to the motion. Oops, never mind. That was very quick. You're a right. quick papist. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why doesn't everybody take a minute to read on um, the motion that she has in the chat? Okay, so Mr. Minaski, you have the word review several times in there. So you're really just asking for the for policy and review committee to review 6002. Or review 6002, and then I just learned about this new library materials policy 6000. So while they're doing coming up with that policy, I'd also like them to include this, um, you know, including a provision in those policies where we, we are restricting explicit sexual content in our instructional materials, including library materials. OK, well, it just says in in our instructional materials. But you just said instructional materials and library materials. Yes, because I just learned about this new policy about 6000 tonight. It wasn't in the um, it wasn't in the presentation, so I'm, that's why I wanted to add it here. Let me see uh, here. I'll copy and paste and add it in there. OK. Um, and I think you just spoke to your motion. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Domanowski on the motion she has? We here? can't discuss until somebody seconds. Oh, thank you. Second. Okay. All right, so we have second a second. Stilesky. Okay, Ms. Stileski second the motion. Okay, now, thank you, Ms. Pomfrey. Um, now, discussion on the motion. Could we um, simplify it just to say, and I don't know if that's what you were trying to do, that. Um, we review and, revi and, and revise policy 6002 and 6000 to include Michael. the provision that she mentioned, including the clear definition that she mentioned. So it would be reviewing and revising both of those policies um, to add the provision that restricts explicit sexual content in instructional library materials including a definition for um, uh, sexual content. I don't know if that simplifies it. Well, you added revise, review and revise. You, you've you added another. Right, because it sounds like we would have to revise to add this um, provision and provide the definition. Can I speak to that real quick? Yes. I mean, I'm I'm giving it I would like to give this sorry, get out sorry um I would like to <laughs> seven year old um I right now um, I want to give it to PR, PRC to look at and to find the def definition for sexually explicit to review um let them kind of take this and roll with it and see if it needs to be done um if it doesn't it doesn't but I want um right for just for right now I just want PRC to be aware of sexually uh, um, explicit sexual content in our materials and if they would consider adding it um, or just just think of, think about it while they're reviewing it um, okay. where it can be added. I don't I don't know if that makes sense. I, I, I don't want to force a hand just yet. I just want them to be considerate of that content. Right. That's why I think the word revise was taking it to another step where you're saying review. I think we just uh, there's a lot of the same numbers. So just for everybody's clarity, 6200 is library. 
6002 is instructional materials. So for some some reason, they all got the same sixes, zeros and twos. So one's about library and one's about instructional materials. Well, the six, the 6200 about library is based off of the 6002, which is instructional materials. And from, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like there's a new policy 6000 that is going to just um, be connected to actual library materials. So that's why I included 6000 and 6002, not 6200. Okay, Dr. DiDonato, do you want to clarify? But you're on mute. Wait, don't clarify yet. So 6200 is a policy about library materials. It does not have an accompanying rule. Most of our policies have, you know, the Board of Ed policy and then the superintendent's rule that really spells out like the oper oper operationalizes the policy. This 6200, which is about library materials, doesn't have a rule currently. There's nothing there. So in the absence of a rule for that, the rule for 6002, which is curriculum materials, has been used, especially because of the um, process for contesting like a book or for to have a material reviewed. Although it's 6002 is really about the selection of curriculum that's universally used. And they even define like an instructional material in 6002 that's a curricular material that's used system wide. So 6200 is the policy about library, but does not have the specificity of a rule with it. Right, and I think that's a huge distinction because sometimes policies and rules get kind of combined as one thing, but policy is what the board is saying is the what. The rule is then how superintendent staff should implement that. So we were missing a rule for one of them, and that's what's being worked on currently by staff, not policy and review committee. Correct, right? correct. And it's and I, rule sorry. for 6,200. Okay. Um, I I think this is more appropriate for rule and not policy. Also, I'm it looks I'm trying to find my list of rules that are I mean excuse me policies that are up for review, and I think six thousand is already on the list, which would make this a moot point as far as part of that part of Ms. Dominowski's motion. But I'm trying to find my list now of what's already scheduled for review. Not especially. I just want to make sure we are taking into. I mean, we've gotten a lot of excerpts from book with some very violent sexual content that I think we need to seriously review. But there is so the review, the review, the review of the books itself would be separate from an actual policy. That yes, would be but part we, of the we review. need to include something where it's not just we're taking two positive reviews of a book and saying then then that's OK. We need to have something that says. Um, I, I just I, I we need to consider some of these books that are not recommended for children under the age of 18 to view because so, there are several in our libraries. So they have the, con they have content warning labels on them in if you click on their reviews online. They might have very positive reviews. I'm sure there's several, but they also have very negative ones. And I think that a lot of parents aren't aware of this because it's not it, it's not well relatively known unless you go through Destiny and you know the titles. I wasn't aware of them until someone until I was made aware of them. And I think that we should not be um, we we should just be aware if we're going to keep them in our libraries, fine, but they should have a label on them. Um, they're just there needs to be a better process. It can't just be in with all of ninth through 12th grade libraries. It needs to, if it has an actual graphic content. And sexual um, variety that's especially if it's violent, it needs to have a warning label on it. That's not just parents saying you can't read this book. You're talking a lot sense. about process and process would then be rule. So it just we just have to be careful where whether it's policy or if, if you're talking process and details, then that would be the rule. But you're also talking about if a book needs to be um, and I can't think if a person if a citizen wants a book reviewed, we didn't go over that piece today, correct? We went over the approval. No, and I'm not. I'm not talking about reviewing any of those books. I'm just talking about if it's pol. I did. I did say PRC um, committee, PRC and staff. So it's not just the committee. I was saying staff as well. 
okay. um, needs to come up with some kind of, I would like them to think about some kind of sexually explicit, um, I don't know, definition, warning, whatever it is, it needs to be included um, so that it's parents are more aware. Because these are, I mean, most of these children are under the age of 18. So I just, um, that was my whole point behind this motion. And it, and I'm not, again, and I kind of went into why I want to force it, but I'm not trying to force the hand. I just wanted, to, I wanted to be, I wanted to be um, thoughtfully talked about, and I would like it talked about between PRC and between staff. And I would like an answer to come before the board or become before the committee. It doesn't, wherever it goes, I just would like it to be thoughtfully talked about so that we don't keep getting, you know, these reading excerpts from parents that are, are hard to hear. I, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you really like hearing some of these passages that are read at meetings, but it's it's hard to hear. So I think that we need to do our due diligence and thoughtfully think about this for our students and our parents. Any other comments on the motion that's currently presented? Ms. Booker Dwyer, do a comment. So we have students in our high school that are over 18 and we we want to make sure that we meet the needs of all of our students. And so, you know, I'm OK with older books to meet um, their their needs. Um, because we have the policy on the list for um, for review and because the uh, school staff school system staff, they're developing a rule. I would want to see the rule first um, to see and then have some discussion around that. And I would, um, you know, want the policy to go through that revision, pol the review policy that's currently being um, led by the, the policy review committee. So I, I don't know if this motion is needed right now. Um, and so Ms. Pumphrey, could you confirm if this policy is on your list? Because if it is, then I think we'll get at what Ms. Dominowski wants, that coupled with the development of the rule that can come back before this um, group for us to see. So I pulled up the list scheduled for review for this um, school year, and I don't see 6002 on the list. Um, my understanding is that 6000 is, um, I'm looking at the motion itself. Uh, is that a new policy or a new rule that we're talking about? And that's new rule, correct? So the rule is for 6,200. Okay, so it's neither not, one of these. Not straight 6,000. Okay. So 6,200 so is, the, is the policy that for library that currently does not have a rule that's being developed. Okay, that's where I misunderstood. So it's, it's not a, it's, an, it's a rule that's being, so then it, that would, yeah, so I need to rewrite it again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Dr. Dinan, does 6,002 have a rule? Yeah. Yes. I, and I, that's I, I, the rule that we're using in the absence of a of rule. I wish the numbers 200. were different for this. Right. Well, for yeah, I'm, I, I, let me just let me just comment that I'm more than happy to add any policy to for review on our list for this year. I'm happy to add anything um, with Ms. Um, with staff's <laughs> excuse me. I can't get my thoughts straight today um, with staff's approval, of course, which, I, you know, I, we can ask and it will be added at some point where it fits into our time schedule. Um, however, I, I if we were to vote on this motion right now, I'd vote no based upon the fact that the way it's written, it seems that some of these things are more rule oriented and not policy oriented. So I'd be happy to add the policy, but I would still vote no to the motion just to clarify my thought processes here. Usually I don't speak to why, why you know, why I'm going to vote a certain way, but I feel in this because of the confusion here, it's necessary to point that out. Other comments? I'm just going to say one thing. The only thing I'm asking is for, for policy committee members and staff to consider including in policy or rule a defined definition of explicit sexual content and whether we restrict it or not, what, what, what just consider it in your conversations. If you want me to rewrite it, I'll rewrite it. I just want to make sure that it's talked about and that there is a clear rule, a, a clear vote, a clear thoughtful conversation that we are um, understanding all of our parents, all of our students, and all like it. It just needs to be. It needs to be addressed in some thoughtful way 
that we're not just sweeping it under the rug and being like, oh, well, we'll just let policy and staff come up with a rule. I just want to make sure I want to I want to hold I want to hold ourselves accountable for addressing the concerns of all of our parents. And this is one of the concerns that keeps coming back to me. And I just want to that's the I'm not asking you to say ban this book. I'm asking you to say consider the concerns of our parents that have we have some books in our library that have some serious content in it that I don't want my children reading. I mean, they're very young right now. Um, I read a passage today that I still can't get out of my mind that's in our library and it's very distressing and I don't I don't understand. I'm sorry. I'll rephrase. I just would like a very thoughtful conversation between staff, between PRC. If you want to say everything's fine, then everything's fine, but I want to make sure it's talked about. I just have one Go ahead, Go ahead Ms. Skolewski. Just one thought related to that. I thought the rated R analogy was a really good one that students on their own might watch a rated R movie, but in a school setting that sort of violates the morality for a lack of a better word right now for what we would allow our students to do in school. So I do understand that we also have to look at the books from that same lens and um, just make a decision on what our morality is there that, OK, on their own, students may read some of those sexually explicit books. But I do think it's important that we define what our value system is for what would be allowed with books in the schools. Other, um, any more discussion before I call for a vote on the motion that is on that is written? If you want me to rewrite it to a more general, I'm I'm rewriting it to like a more general, like you know, I'm making a motion for PRC staff and PRC and staff to consider what is sexual explicit content, whether or not it is appropriate in our in our school buildings or library, and how are we going to define it? And if if anything, we're gonna. I, I'm kind of paraphrasing right now, but just just to have that conversation. That's all I'm gonna put in there. It, I'm not gonna. Involve, I'm just gonna say any policy, any rule. I'm not gonna name. It's just I want to make sure that conversation is had. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Demonowski. And any last comments? Okay, but Ms. Demonowski, if you're typing, are you changing the the motion that you had on the table before? I feel like I have to change it because I don't want it to be turned down just because people are confused by it because I'm not trying to change any rule or policy. I just want PRC to talk about it when they are talking about these rules and policy or staff. I realize that PRC has nothing to do with the rules. So I just want to make sure that as a group, when these rules and policies are being written, that we are not excluding explicit sexual content, whether or not it it applies. It, it, we can appease all grades, all ages, all ethnicities, all identities, and not have some of this very graphic sec, um, explicit sexual content. And that I just want to make sure that that is separate from trying to um, have a very broad selection of books that include a variety of, of all family types. We need to have a separate category category for sexual sexually explicit or explicit sexual whatever you know okay. what i'm trying to say just so, because we're still in a, you know a formal meeting are you withdrawing your original motion uh, um i don't want to withdraw because i don't want it to i don't want it to go away um, oh, i'm trying to figure out how it got a second, so Ms. Teleski second the motion that you typed into the chat. That's the motion that's on the table right now. So I will call for. I mean, I'm not. I'm not asking anyone to rewrite it. I'm not asking anyone to include it. I'm just asking for a conversation to be had. So I don't understand um, what the confusion. I guess I don't understand what the confusion is. And I. Well, I, I agree. I'm just trying to follow Robert's rule. So you have a motion. The motion was second. We had a discussion. So the next step would be a vote unless you are amending. No, it's OK. Just OK. Sorry. 
No, no, unless you are amending the motion. No, I'm, at, the, at this point, I, I, um, okay. I'm, I didn't mean, yeah, just um, we can vote okay. on it. I, I don't, I don't know how to write it any more, um, you know, non asking for change, just asking for you to talk about the change. That's all. Okay. All right, so we'll leave the motion. The motion has been second. We had a discussion. So at this point, Ms. Ms. Teleski, are you raising your hand? Oh, sorry. No? Okay, I'm, I just thought sorry. I saw something. Okay. Um, all right, so at this point, Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? No. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Okay, so it was three to two, so we did not get um, a majority. Okay. All right, I think we are finished with that presentation for this evening. We're also way over. So is, is there any further business? I just have one thought, but we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> okay, everybody go through. Okay, go ahead. So um, just, I'm a former social studies teacher, so just want to make sure that we're planning ahead and being proactive with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, that we're giving teachers tools, suggestions, um, talking points, just so that everybody is prepared, you know, for questions from students, from, you know, words of protest, words of support, words of non-support, just want to make sure that we're being proactive and we don't have to talk about it. You know, we That's can, fine. I, I do know that things have been sent out, but Dr. DiDonato, can you address that briefly? So there are resources provided to teachers um, about controversial topics that are, are happening within the, the our country or the world. Um, and those resources were resent out to staff um, when this conflict began. Um, so really just understanding that there's, you know, various viewpoints, but trying to help staff with how do you negotiate those conversations or facilitate them with students. So um, that has been re-provided and staff have been redirected to it. Any other um, further business? Um, so since there's no further business um, meeting, is now, whoops, wait a second. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next curriculum committee meeting will be held on November 2nd, 2023. And now at this time, the meeting is adjourned. I apologize for the lateness, but it was not a conversation that I thought we could, um, we should stop. So I appreciate everybody um, staying on till seven o'clock, 07. All right, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.